I'm Poonam Yadav, ACMW UK Chair and Lecturer at University of York, UK. My co-host today is Anesthesia Najrova, Project Coordinator at ACMW UK Chapter. It, today our speaker is Professor uh, Cecilia Mascarlo, prof, full professor of com mobile systems at Computer Science Department at University of Cambridge and fellow of Jesus College. It's my great pleasure to invite Professor Cecilia to Mascarlo to um, speak about her recent research on listening to your health, mobile health diagnostic through audio signals. Without taking much of our time, I would like to invite a Professor to start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will um, share the screen um, if I can. There we go. I hope you can all see my slides. So this talk about uh, is about my recent interest on uh, using audio signals to uh, detect health. Um, these signals come from devices that we have around, uh, we wear such as mobile phone and watches, but it could also be devices that are in our environment, such as, uh, you know, this, uh, commodity devices starting to appear. Um, the, why would you want to do automated sound-based diagnostics? Well, because of these devices being reasonably cheap, um, this would allow uh, the, the diagnosis to scale to uh, populations, large populations, quite cheaply, uh, which is something that often for medical application is not the case. Also, it would allow for continuous sensing uh, because these devices are with us in a way or another uh, throughout our day. Um, and, in, and if uh, a specific technology is needed, they could even be embedded in, in tattoos and things that can be uh, specific to a portion of the body. So they, they allow for this continuous sensing idea that um, could lead to you know, a more refined diagnosis. But let's go into details of what, uh, what I mean by all this. So the, the project um, all together um, is funded by the European Research Council and it, can, it has uh, various aims. The first aim, and you will understand why this is important, is collect large data sets in the wild uh, that could uh, influence uh, modeling. So the, the, the clinical areas we're very interested in are cardiovascular, respiratory and digestive. And by no mean, uh, we are the first to look at uh, audio signals for these areas but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a quite those are the obvious areas but there are, there are many more that could probably are emerging and people coming and talking to me about these areas more and more. Uh, we hope to devise robust models that work on this data set, on this sort of data, and they would help in terms of screening for perhaps a class of diseases, then classify the disease, um, the, tip, the specific um, of the disease, identify perhaps the progression of a disease that is known into um, a patient, or um, really act as an emergency alarm when something really is going wrong. So those are characteristics that we, we want to look um, at uh, for, for the kind of models we want to build. Um, the next step, of course, is to then integrate this possibly on a device that doesn't need uh, the computations to be elsewhere in the cloud, but could live quite close to the user's data, uh, being ob obviously audio data, uh, we, we really want to keep it close to the user, and integrating it with other, other sensing technology, not just uh, the, uh, the audio, but there, there are other sensors that could uh, lead to uh, better diagnostics with integrations of, uh, of the findings into the model. And of course, I already mentioned continuous sensing, so continuous monitoring of the condition so that um, we won't have a diagnosis that is only uh, at a certain granularity, we would have data from the patient uh, continuously. One thing that uh, I might talk to in the, about in the end is the incorporation of interpretability. All this automation of diagnostics makes sense only if we keep clinicians in the loop in a, in, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, there is no point in going for black box approaches. Um, we don't think it's the way to go. So finding methodologies that allow perhaps to give information to a clinician uh, so that um, it simplifies their work rather than substitute the clinician. Uh, so that, that is the general aim. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll start from works, uh, work that we have done uh, quite, quite a long time ago. This is a paper in Ubicon 2010, 
where we were showing that we were able to use a device. At the time, it was a smartphone, uh, Nokia. It wasn't a smartphone, it was actually a Nokia phone. Uh, the pictures you see down on the on the on the left, uh, bottom left, I actually I re uh, a re implementation of it on an Android phone, but the original one was a, an old Nokia Symbian brick phone, uh, showing that by um, by the phone listening to the voice of the user, we could um, interpret emotions. We could detect emotions automatically on device. So uh, work on voice and interpretation of voice has been going on for many years. Um, this is uh, an MIT technology review report, uh, not of our work, of work of others, that has shown that the voice has features and characteristics uh, that might indicate diseases, such as, of course, post-traumatic stress disorder. So psychiatric disorders could be in could be diagnosed through voice signals, but less obviously uh, heart diseases, um, heart, heart um, pathologies. And this could be because uh, the voice apparatus get hardened by certain um, diseases and therefore the voice get altered by that. Or so it, it's like a combination and dependency between um, our uh, clinical part of the bodies. Uh, sorry for the terminology not being right. Other colleagues in uh, the University of Washington have tried to use uh, 911 calls or 999 calls, as they would call them in the UK, uh, to um, use voice uh, to detect some biomarkers of um, cardiac arrest. And this is a paper they published on this topic. They then went and uh, added noise to the signal, simulating the fact that they, they could imagine this voice is coming from, I don't know, a, 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 an Amazon Echo that you have in your house, and therefore you're able to track the user's voice and detecting cardiac arrest directly from um, and voices detected in the environment. So it's not just all about uh, voices. Uh, we use sound to uh, understand heart um, health. Um, sound. Uh, through auscultation of the body is used in addition to signals coming from other more electrical signals oriented uh, machinery such as ECG, electrocardiograms, to understand the full pathology of uh, the health of the heart. On your right, you see a screen of uh, pathologists of the valves um, and abnormal pathologies of the valves that can be detected by auscultation. By auscultation, I mean that the doctor often goes with a stethoscope and listens to the, to the body, and in this particular case, to the heart. This is a technique that um, is still in use, but is uh, often substituted by more automatic techniques uh, and more, um, let's say, simpler techniques, like, such as echocardiograms. Um, it is, however, um, a technique that uh, has been used for many, many years in clinical research. And, um, and now it appears that uh, mainly consultants are able to do this listening because it's actually quite difficult to, to listen, know what you're listening for. To the point that when we were trying to collect data, we had to really hunt for, um, this, is a, this is Harvey, this is a, a, a medical uh, auscultation simulator. And there are only very few now since hospital because they're completely, sub this, this, doctors are not very much trained in auscultation anymore. So uh, if you're looking for uh, data of this kind, it's actually quite hard to find. In this kind of domains, there's very little data on which we could try to do automation. And I've just shown you an example of, um, of cardiology, but this is also true also in respiratory and in digestive, as you can imagine. So we, we are in a state where Training does not often happen on data. Training of doctors happen by listening to the same patient and learning the technique, as far as I understand what my colleagues are telling me. So data is limited. It's starting to be there, though. Um, and so there, there are some papers coming out, uh, and this is one example, where they have a limited data set collected with a digital stethoscope, where they try to do heart murmur recognition through um, automatic uh, sound analysis from digital stethoscope data. So this, this, is, uh, this is going on and happening. Uh, however, the conversation often with the doctors happen in a way that uh, made me realize that it, when you start having uh, data and you start having certain types of data, then the questions, the conversation between us and clinicians is, can we 
are we sure we can diagnose disease X from sound collected from this, uh, this point uh, in the body? And um, the, the answer often is, well, you know, the human ear can listen to this and we can, we can get to that, but what, what, what could a machine do? Would, would, would the machine be able to do something differently than the doctor can? Would, would it be able to listen, uh, to hear something that uh, the human doctor or some human doctors couldn't hear? And this is also true because a human doctor can also, cannot be hearing continually on the body. Usually they do spot checks. Whenever you go to a visit, you would hear that noise. But, um, but machines could have continuous uh, input. And therefore, perhaps we are now um, generating new kind of uh, diagnostics uh, techniques just by allowing for this to happen. Now, um, we have started on one, one branch of this project, we're starting to produce devices like this. This is a preliminary device the, the, the produced by one of my master's students last year. It's essentially a belt that has a, a, a microphone that you put into the, on the chest. And the idea is there to try to see how much we could uh, listen to, what would be the noise levels, how we can isolate it, how we can then uh, do local computation. This is a direction that we are following. And then, um, a few months ago, as you probably all know, um, COVID happened. And with COVID, uh, because we were doing this kind of uh, audio sound diagnostic detection, um, a colleague of mine came to me and said, well, um, how about, wouldn't your project be able to help with this? Wouldn't be able to um, do something with the sounds of COVID? And um, COVID is a respiratory disease. Um, as we know, it has, it has some respiratory symptoms and uh, respiratory consequences. And we know, uh, this is a survey, um, that um, the, there have been research in analyzing, like, like in cardiac research, in automatically analyzing respiratory sounds uh, to diagnose disease. Um, COPD, pneumonia, and asthma are examples of diseases that have been uh, considered and studied through sounds collections um, in, in limited um, and controlled scenarios. Uh, but this, this is a direction that uh, exists. And so uh, with this in mind, we uh, developed a, an app, a simple app, um, which can be found at covid-19-sounds.org. Uh, it's both in Android and iOS, and it's also it was a, it has a web platform. And my colleague Pietro Cicuta is the one who came to me and said, "Hey, can you do something um, with your project?" Because he was aware of my project. And Andres Floto is the professor of respiratory biology and research um, in lung infections in Papua Health Hospital in Cambridge. And so, with their expertise and their help, um, we we crowdsource data. We um, so, so the rest of this talk, um, a good portion of this talk, is about what, how we went about it and what we found. So the app, this is the iOS uh, app. What, what does the app do? Well, these are three screens that appear uh, to the user once the user downloads the app. And they're essentially crowdsourcing breathing data. So the first screen asks the user to breathe in and out deeply five times. Um, the second screen asks them to cough. And uh, by pressing the record button, uh, the data would go back to our servers. And the third screen collects the voice. So it's asking uh, the user to uh, read a sentence three times. So we're collecting cough, breathing, and uh, voice data in our data set. We're also collecting um, answers to questionnaires uh, that ask about medical history. They also ask about um, um, the symptoms, if, if, if the user has symptoms, and they asked um, a range of questions about testing for COVID. As, as the person being tested for COVID, as the test been positive, as the test been negative. It also collects with the user consent um, a few demographics such as age and gender, as well as um, location. Uh, the user can, of course, not, not say this. The graphs uh, you see here are um, on the top right, you see the cumulative. Um, graph of users. Um, this is not 
complete. This was just May and June. As you can see, you, you, we started at the beginning. So the first month is April. Um, there's no label for April there. And uh, May and June uh, are the months where we mostly collected data. And the collection is still ongoing. Um, one of uh, the researchers in the team has informed me that we had about three, 400 new users uh, just last week. So uh, at the bottom, you see the statistics on, well, the distribution really on the age of the participants, which seem quite uh, well distributed. PNTS means prefer not to say, so we have a fraction of users who prefer not to give their information. In the same way, this is the distribution of countries and uh, many users have decided not to give us their location, which is uh, fair enough, it's, uh, it's their right to do so. Uh, but they, those are users that then decided to contribute then their sounds, which is uh, very well received. Um, we asked the users to report their medical history, as I was saying. This is just a graph from the Android uh, part of the, um, of the data set. We haven't yet dived into all this. As, as you can see, this is very recently collected data. Um, so um, high blood pressure is the highest reported um, medical history um, that we have here in the Android app at the moment, uh, followed by asthma. Uh, with a little bit. The most common joint um, medical history is asthma and high blood pressure, as you can see in one of the columns, the first one that has a line between the two dots. And you can see other combinations of uh, the symptoms, uh, sorry, of the medical history. And here are the symptoms. So these two graphs represent the population of Android users that had, at the time, so we had a snapshot of Android users. And um, on the left, there are the known COVID tested um, users. So users who uh, said they've not been tested for COVID. And on the right is a fraction of COVID positive users. Sorry, um, one thing I haven't said about these numbers is that we have about 8,000 contributed um, users. However, given that the testing wasn't very much happening, especially in countries such as the United Kingdom, we only have 200 that said they've tested positives. And, and mainly we believe it's because people have not been tested, but there were more prevalence of, um, of COVID probably users in the population. So when here I say not COVID tested, um, that includes probably people who have COVID. And so in our analysis, we need to be careful to this distinction. But the COVID positives are people who have tested COVID for posit, per, uh, tested positive for COVID. And um, one thing I would like to point out is um, that the, the last symptoms on in the right graph is smell and taste loss, um, which does not appear much as a symptom in the top symptoms um, on the generally known COVID tested population, which is um, higher. Uh, but we, we start seeing this sort of um, indication that the non COVID tested uh, patients have a sort of slightly different distribution of symptoms. Uh, we've done something more to uh, distinguish COVID positive and COVID negative uh, patients, and I'll tell you a bit more of that. But this in, in, in is indicative. As you can see, uh, both populations have coughs. Uh, so wet coughs, dry coughs, uh, uh, you know, the dry cough is also uh, an indicator, a symptom in the non-COVID testing. So um, other researchers have tried to look at um, cough analysis of, uh, of, of COVID automatically. And this is a paper you find in archive that has tried to use some deep learning on a, a very small controlled data set with respect to other data um, that uh, was collected from coughs of other diseases. Um, and as I said, this, uh, this is quite a controlled study that they've done, but it has inspired us. And that's why I, I think it needs prominence and citing here. Um, and we um, also um, linked some work from CMU. Rita Singh in CMU who was also given an interview in Forbes has indicated that her, um, her studies show that uh, there are some differences in the cost that can be seen in the spectrogram. So here you have a, a display of spectrograms of our data, a COVID positive patient's cough and a healthy cough from someone that, so, so how do we, uh, decide that the cough is healthy. Well, we picked users from uh, countries that had a prevalence of an, an, 
a known prevalence of the disease at the beginning of April. So um, for, for some of the study where we wanted to make sure that um, we were picking healthy uh, users, we used uh, that, that sort of uh, guarantee. Now we have introduced in our app um, a way of uh, someone testing, telling us that they've tested negative for the test. And so now we have even better data of healthy costs. But at the time, this graph was done uh, considering just the fact that there was no COVID in Greece at a certain point yet. At least we think there wasn't. But anyway, in, in her study, Rita Singh um, indicates that there are some vocal folds after each cough. Uh, and these are, you can see the, the lightning part of the spectrogram indicating the cough, and then the blue circle indicates these vocal folds happening. And she mentions that a wet cough um, has a high energy spread that could be distinguished by, uh, by looking at the spectrogram. And also that there are some low frequency oscillations in the coughs of COVID uh, patients. So with this in mind, um, we went on and um, analyzed our crowdsourced data. Um, this is a paper that we just got news uh, two days ago was accepted at KDD 2020 Health Days. Um, it's also an archive, but the results, we, we're going to update the results in archive because the results we got now are a little better. So if you wait a few days, uh, you'll see the final version of the paper there. So how does our um, COVID-19 positive detection work? Well, this is really the pipeline. We record coughs and breathing, so we don't use voice yet. We just record, uh, we, we just use the coughs and breathing. We have a mechanism to um, construct audio features over the data. Uh, we then consider a group of participants from our um, large data set, and then we try to train a model to do a binary classification. I will go through the four phases of the study um, uh, now. So the input and the data, uh, we consider just cough and breathing sounds. The data is crowdsourced. And as I said, not many people have been tested for COVID at the time that um, we, we started, we have most of the data. Are they healthy or are they healthy, really healthy or are they COVID and, and they're just not being tested? So um, for this particular study, we used uh, users without symptoms from countries where no COVID prevalence, uh, no COVID was prevalent at the time. And uh, you might say this might not be uh, the best um, approximation or the best uh, thing to do, but that, that's what we thought um, was uh, the best we could have in the, in the data. Also, I, I should highlight that we have to trust the users. If a user reports that they've tested positive for COVID, this is our ground truth, right? So um, this is wild data and working with that um, is difficult. The assumption is that perhaps in uh, in large numbers, all these uh, aberrations are, um, are disappearing. The fact that someone perhaps is lying is a minority, we hope, um, but uh, those are caveats and assumptions that we had to make. So um, we modeled by using uh, standard audio features uh, from, from the audio, as well as using um, a Google train model called Vigigish and um, using it a pre-trained model on our data generating the features from that model. The advantage of doing this is that the VGG model is um, able to, um, is, is a convolution neural network based model and therefore um, complementing it with uh, features coming directly from our data uh, perhaps add, is able to capture more temporal um, characteristics of the, the, the sounds that we have. This is uh, what we see, and you will see in the data that perhaps this is what's happening. So features of uh, sample calves, uh, the blue line is a simple row um, calf set. As you could see from the app, we're asking the user to cough three times, and this is what you see there. And we have um, onset periods, and we sample, we use the, we take the blue, um, line and we trim it and so the the yellow line at the bottom is just the trim signal uh, from the top and we calculate some generic features um, audio features of this data we also uh, do frame level features and I, I won't go into the details of these features but essentially they are calculating energy and magnitude of uh, you know the, the signal uh, characteristics so uh, that we can put them into our framework um, male spectrograms of the cough is over onto the, uh, 
the left, top left, and we obviously get MSCCs and differentiation and um, differentiation differentiation of MSCCs and also as features, as well as um, considering the VGG species. So the evaluation tasks are um, determined in this way. So what, what have we tried? We have tried to see if by using this input, we can uh, detect, we can binary classify causative, COVID positives versus non-COVID tested um, users. As I said, these non-COVID tested users are users that are from countries that um, are not with prevalent, uh, prevalent of the disease. And therefore we think, um, you know, are, are actually healthy uh, patients. We have restricted our data set because we only had about 200 uh, COVID positive um, and uh, we had also to clean the data. This is about, uh, this is small data, right? So that's why we're using classification that is not uh, deep learning. It's because uh, the data at the moment is still very small. The data set is growing and we hope to grow it even further. The first thing um, we, we have now is, um, a good sample of uh, patients that have said they've tested negative for COVID. So those, those will be our health in the next uh, incarnation of this, uh, of this evaluation. The second task we tried is to consider COVID uh, positive tested um, users that have said they have a cough and COVID healthy, let's say healthy um, users with a cough and try to see if we could even distinguish this. And then we looked at um, positive tested COVID with asthma and non-COVID tested with asthma. So trying to, to, to really add a little bit more and, and trying to see if we can detect an asthma cough from a COVID cough. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we have a signal, we have an indication of this, but we're not there with the results yet, absolutely. I mean, this is just an initial analysis uh, from, two, from when we started a couple of months ago. These are, of course, the initial findings showing that, um, oh, I should say that, so your tasks are on the first uh, column. And uh, on the fourth column, uh, I indicate that one to three simply indicates that we're using handcrafted feature, just the VGG features, or a combination of both. As you can see, three, the third line for each task is the one that works best, which is the one that combines VGG feature with uh, handcrafted features for all the tasks. So there is a signal there. Um, and these are the best uh, modalities. So for the first task, it looks like using a combination of cover breathing is the best. Uh, for the second is the cough, for the third is the, just the breathing. That works uh, better. But, uh, you know, and this is the sample of the users we've used, but, um, and, and as you can see, uh, they're quite small for the moment because it, that's what the data had. We also um, augmented this data. You can find more details in, in the current paper and then uh, with more results in the next incarnation of the paper. But um, we try to augment uh, the data a little bit to see uh, what we could improve the performance. Now, I, um, one, one important thing of this type of data that we have is that the app is not only collect cough and breathing, it's also collecting voice, which we haven't yet used and we think will be very challenging to use, but we, we'll get there at some point. But also, um, if you have downloaded the app, you would know that every couple of days we ping a user to um, send sounds back. So to repeat the crowdsourcing, um, which means that for some of the users, we start having a progression. We start seeing more than one sample per person, for, for that person. And we, we haven't looked into this, but you can imagine that this could be very promising as a technique to see how a disease progresses. Um, we, we don't yet know how many of the COVID positives of, or can you imagine someone who started using the app and then after a while developed the disease or one that um, had the disease and then grew out of the, well, healed and, and had no disease. So, so all this uh, to us is very interesting data and we hope uh, to be able to analyze it pretty soon. So I, I will, you know, this, this is general for the COVID project, but I would like to, um, just go through quickly, and I think I have uh, some more minutes to discuss this further, some challenges and opportunities in this sort of area. So noise and heterogeneity, um, especially in this crowdsource um, data collection, but also even when you use digital stethoscopes and things, 
um, you have noise that you have to deal with. Um, you have the fact that phones are all different and then people decide to talk into the phone at a certain distance. They decide to, uh, you know, they're in an environment which is different from every other time they do it or every other user. And all this needs to be considered. Um, also, we have no labels. In most cases in this data, it's, it, at best, you would know um, that uh, the users told you that it's COVID positive, um, but uh, it's difficult to detect, to, to really um, get good labeling. Is, is this user really having a cough or had a cough before? Uh, even the way in which we, we collect the data is, is not very specific. So it's, you have to work with what you have. Um, this is also true, by the way, for the for any uh, cardiac data collected with the digital stethoscope, because even then um, you can afford to label with the clinician, but perhaps not precisely, um, you know, the all the time series of the data you see. So um, there, there are very big challenges working with this type of time series data collected in this data type. On device, I mentioned it at the beginning. Um, I think when you're talking audio, uh, it is very important that uh, we, we let the data live as close as possible to the user. So can we try to develop models that uh, are then going on a person's phone or, a pers or even a smaller device? Um, so to do some initial analysis, at least, um, from, a, from a model locally. Um, we have a project with Google, which is looking at learning continuously, obviously, obviously new tasks, people change behavior, things develop in a way that perhaps even the learning needs to adapt to the current situation, learning conditions. So can we do this learning um, continuously and automatically, possibly even on device? And also one other thing I mentioned in the, in the initial part of the talk is accuracy is not enough. And I, I always like to, uh, use this as a study um, you know we have an apple watch that uh, gives a theory of fibrillation um, indication so it uses um, you know it does an ecg automatically on on your device and there was a report that uh, it had lots of false positives which was generating load on on people panicked and going to the doctor so what can we do to um, allow for interpretability in addition to accuracy and uncertainty. So how sure are you of a certain result? This is a study that's done on, um, you know, images of uh, red eyes, and it's trying to, in addition to accuracy, indicate the level of confidence of um, the, the prediction of, of, of the disease. Can we incorporate some of that into our prediction techniques so that there is a better relationship between uh, the machinery and the clinician? Um, this has also been brought into mobile devices, how it can be done on device and, um, and, and consider the fact that it needs to be efficient resource wise. So all these areas are, you know, kind of bringing together, tying together. And, um, and I think there are various directions in which this could, could start moving. So with this, uh, I've been told that you like asking questions. So I think this is the end of my talk. One thing that I should say is that, uh, okay, this is the website where you can find the COVID app, but I should also indicate that we are um, hoping to release all the models and um, all the code for our apps and the data. The data is sensitive. As you can imagine, we have voices and uh, we're not allowed to release the data openly, except uh, we, will, we are trying to come up with uh, some licenses agreement you can, we can put on the, on the web page so that we can share the data uh, institution to institution um, and allowing uh, people to, to ask us for the data or part of the data. Um, this has not been put in place, but it is our intention to uh, release everything um, as soon as we can. We've, we've moved really fast with this uh, particular project, and so it has been difficult to um, to do everything. So um, I will, um, I think I will stop now and um, I will take questions if uh, there are any.